now in English. To you who is wondering if your zazen has been good for something, what's zazen good for? Absolutely nothing. This good for nothing has got to sink into your flesh and bones until you're truly practicing what's good for nothing. Until then, your zazen is really good for nothing. Throwing yourself completely into doing what's good for absolutely nothing, why not give it a try? So you say you'd like to try doing zazen in order to become a better person. Become a better person by doing zazen? How ridiculous. How could a person ever become something better? You say you want to become a better person by doing zazen. Zazen isn't learning about how to be a person. Zazen is to stop being a person. Some say Zen means having an empty mind, right? You won't have an empty mind until you're dead. They think that with Zazen, everything gets better. Foolish. Zazen means forgetting better and worse. You're not going to earn tips doing Zazen. The day is as long as a child's day. The mountain is as quiet as the eternal past. Zazen is unsatisfying. Unsatisfying for who? For the ordinary person. People are never satisfied. In our Soto school, Zazen isn't so exciting. Ordinary people are always looking for excitement, sports, gambling on horse races, and things like that. What makes them so popular? It's the excitement of winning and losing. Isn't it self-evident? How could that which is eternal and infinite ever satisfy human desires? How could that which fills the whole universe ever fit into an ordinary person's idea of satisfaction? Unsatisfying. Simply practicing Zazen. Unsatisfying. Realising Zazen with this body. Unsatisfying. Absorbing Zazen into your flesh and blood. Being watched by Zazen. Cursed by Zazen. Blocked by Zazen. Dragged around by Zazen. Every day crying tears of blood. Isn't that the happiest form of life you can imagine? Someone asks, I can understand that during Zazen we're Buddhas. But does that mean that we are just ordinary people when we are not doing Zazen? When a thief steals, he is a thief. If for a moment he isn't stealing anything, does that mean that he isn't a thief anymore? Is eating in order to steal and eating in order to practice Zazen the same thing or are they different? Someone who steals once isn't trusted anymore. Someone who practices Zazen once practices eternal Zazen. Zazen is really an amazing thing. When you are sitting, it doesn't seem like Zazen is anything particularly good, but when you see it from the outside, there's nothing that could be so majestic. With everything else, it's usually the other way around. Looked at objectively, there's not much to it. You're the only one who thinks what you're doing is so terribly important. The reason the Buddha Dharma fills the whole universe is because it doesn't offer anything you can grab onto. Making a constant effort isn't difficult if you don't grab onto anything. True practice without profit means practicing like the wooden man and the stone woman. Zazen is transparent. It has no flavor. When we give Zazen a flavor, it becomes something for ordinary people. Zazen isn't so fashionable. What's fashionable is what comes natural for an ordinary person, like the fight over winning and losing in sports. Zazen isn't fashionable because it's flavourless and, ungra <clears throat> and ungraspable. It doesn't interest little children. The immense transparent sky isn't the same thing as a bonsai tree or little statues for your little altar. It's infinitely vast. Nonetheless, people prefer trimming around on their bonsais or tending to their little statues. You want seasoning for your consciousness. That's why you're not impressed by the transparent, tasteless Buddha Dharma. Some say that they have too many disturbing thoughts during Zazen. It's only because the waves calm and the blood congestion sinks that we become conscious of, conscious of disturbing thoughts at all. You say, when I do Zazen, I get disturbing thoughts. Foolish. The fact is that it's only in Zazen that you're aware of your disturbing thoughts at all. When you dance around with your disturbing thoughts, you don't notice them at all. When a mosquito bites you during Zazen, you notice it right away. But when you're dancing and a flea bites your balls, you don't notice it at all. A layman asks, I've been practicing Zazen for a long time, but I still have many disturbing thoughts, and I don't know what to do about it. 
Only once during an air raid, when bombs were going off, I did Zazen and didn't have a single disturbing thought. I'd never had such good Zazen. Still, afterwards, everything was like it was before. Isn't there any way to practice a Zazen like that again? Swaki Roshi answered, Yes, Koan Zen. Someone gives you a koan and yells you into the corner. There's no room for disturbing thoughts. But still, afterwards, everything will be like it was before. You've just pushed your disturbing thoughts aside for a moment. On the other hand, in Dogen Zenji's Shikantaza, it's about completely manifesting your true form. Your ugliness is exposed, and you see yourself for who you really are, and you realise that you're constantly producing disturbing thoughts, just like a crowd blows bubbles. In fact, it's a merit of Zazen to be able to see that you're full of disturbing thoughts. When you're completely preoccupied with something, nothing else comes to mind. With a drink in your hand and your arm around a geisha, you don't feel the flea biting you at all. For that instant, all your thoughts are pushed aside. During Zazen, though, you're so aware of this flea that you don't know what to do with yourself. Because in Zazen, you aren't numb. You've become transparent and clear. Isn't it natural that in the course of our lives we'll experience all kinds of psychological phenomena? We have all kinds of thoughts during Zazen, and we wonder if that's correct. <clears throat> the fact that we can ask ourselves this proves that the nature of Zazen is pure, and that this pure nature is looking us in the eye. When we dance around drunk in our underwear, we don't question ourselves at all. Zazen is the unity of Buddha and this ordinary person. At precisely this moment, you can see yourself with the eyes of Buddha, and it's clear how imperfect you really are. In light of the fact that you are originally a Buddha, it's only the ordinary person in you who is disturbed by disturbing thoughts. Don't whine, don't stare into space, just sit. <clears throat> Senshi practiced with Yakusan for 30 years to clarify the single matter. What single matter? The fact that Zazen alone is enough. Okay. <clears throat> so the two things I'm going to talk about for this chapter is um, what does good for nothing actually mean and if Zazen doesn't change me then why on earth do I bother with it at all so before I came to Antaiji <clears throat> I heard certain people uh, interpret this phrase good for nothing as meaning um, good for everything that Zazen is good for everything because um, basically what was done was that the idea of nothing was kind of latched onto the Buddhist concept of emptiness. And they kind of created this idea that when we practice Zazen, um, we are one with everything. And I guess when Kodo says things in this chapter, like when he's describing Zazen, he says that which is eternal and infinite, infinite or that which fills the whole universe. Um, yeah, it makes you to kind of form this concept of good for nothing. But I think if you attach this idea along with any other idea to Kodo's famous phrase, um, the message is lost. Because as he says here, it, you're giving Zazen a flavour and you're still grabbing onto something. Um, as he also says, this good for nothing has got to sink into your flesh and bones until you're truly practising what's good for nothing. Until then, your Zazen is really good for nothing. So I think yeah, even if you have an idea of what this nothing is, if you're still creating some sort of image or concept, um, yeah, you're still, as he says, practicing what's really just good for nothing. Um, therefore, I think this idea of practicing something that's good for nothing is, is very difficult. Um, I think it's a human tendency to always add some extra sort of idea or some other layer onto what we're doing. Um, when I was young, I was always looking for some sort of meaning in my life. Even as a, a young kid, actually, I always wanted to be good at something. Um, I was easily influenced by uh, various things, like when I was kind of, I don't know, maybe about eight or nine, I was watching a lot of uh, like Kung Fu films, and uh, Jackie Chan was like my hero, because I was born in Hong Kong, and he was, you know, he's kind of like the, the, the guy or people who from Hong Kong look up to. So I used to, uh, you know, ride around on my bike, uh, still with stabilizers on, and I'd try and sort of do some like Jackie Chan type stunts, like I don't know, ride down some stairs and then jump off and maybe graze my elbow or something. Um, so yeah, I was always 
had in my mind, and I guess I was just raised this way, uh, that you know you have to be good at something, otherwise what's the point? Um, even now, I'm still you know falling into this trap of thinking that I need to be something. Um, because I, I've agreed to continue my relationship with my girlfriend, uh, you know, one day I, I will return. And, you know, I, I sometimes wonder what I'll do in the future and I get stuck in these kind of loops of, oh, maybe I should do this or maybe I should do that. Um, but really, you know, this is just, uh, you know, you're just getting lost in, in your thoughts uh, and it's nothing else. Um, and at the same time, whilst I was always looking to be something, I was, as I said in my last week, I kind of reached this point maybe in my later teens, where I started to jump to this idea that actually everything was meaningless. So at one moment I was looking for something with meaning and then kind of arriving, oh actually, you know, there's just meaninglessness. And stuck in this kind of loop, um, I, I guess I realised I was, you know, I was stuck, you know, what, what on earth am I doing? Um, you know, one minute I was jumping at something and then the next minute I was thinking everything was meaningless. Um, and it was around this point um, that I, you know, discovered that good for nothing zazen. Um, I'd been sitting before, but once I kind of came across this idea, uh, it felt like a kind of a bit of a liberation, actually. Um, as Kodo says, zazen is unsatisfying. Unsatisfying for whom? For the ordinary person. People are never satisfied. Um, I think society teaches us that. No, no matter what we do of our life, it has to have some value, you know, it needs to be good for something. Uh, you know, it should make us happier or make us richer, make us a more interesting person. And I guess most importantly, um, we have to be better than our neighbour. Um, because we're used to interacting with the world in this way, you know, choosing satisfaction or chasing it rather. Um, you know, Zazen for me is, is really, it's such a relief. Um, for Kodo as well, he says, Zazen is really an amazing thing. When you're sitting, it doesn't seem like Zazen is anything particularly good. But when you see it from the outside, there's nothing that could be so majestic. Um, this line actually makes me think of, there was um, some story with Kodo where uh, when he was young, I think, I can't remember which temple he was at, but he was um, just sitting Zazen on his own. And then uh, the woman who was responsible for maintaining the grounds came in and saw him sitting. And she uh, previously she just always scolded him, just saying he was like a kind of miserable kid or something. But then when she saw him sitting Zazen on his own, I think she did like a prostrate prostration or something, and thought, "Oh wow, this is like something holy." So yeah, I guess when we're sitting Zazen, maybe after a while, you know, you kind of think, "Oh God, you know, I'm just sort of seeing all my ugly sides again every day." But um, I guess maybe from the outside, this kind of you know, physical attitude of facing the world in this way, um, yeah, has a kind of graceful appearance. Um, but yeah, I think while it was all you know fair and good that I'd had this sort of relief of you know discovering this like good for nothing zazen and thinking how great it was, um, when I'd actually decided that I was going to leave all my loved ones behind and come here. You know, how on earth am I to explain such a thing? Uh, you know, why are you doing this? Oh, look, it's for no reason. There's no real reasons. You know, it's good for nothing. I think to, to try and explain this to someone uh, in this way, you know, to say you're going to leave everyone behind for this, you know, just maybe they just think you're, you've gone completely mad. So then instead I kind of changed my tone a bit and I started using this thing, oh, you know, why, why do you practice? Why do you want to do this? Um, so I, I started to say, oh, you know, I want to become a better person. And as Kodo says in this uh, chapter, you know, that such a thing is, is foolish. Uh, it's, it's completely ridiculous. You know, Zazen is to stop being a person. Um, you have to, yeah, all the things that you're kind of wanting to do because of what you think, uh, you know, you stop doing that when you're sitting in Zazen. Um, so I think, you know, not expecting any improvements from doing Zazen is, you know, something that's very hard. I think, uh, you know, over time maybe you think you've got a sort of, you know, handle on it. Oh, I'm, I'm really doing this good for nothing thing now. But then, you know, these kind of desires to be something maybe will creep back. Um, so when, yeah, when Uchiyama, he, when he started practicing with Kodo, um, he asked him this question and he basically said, 
after many decades of practicing with a strong person like you, uh, could someone as weak as me become a little stronger? And then as he wrote, um, Kodo's reply was, no, Zazen is good for nothing. He had a loud, deep voice and was powerful and resolute when he's talking about Kodo. He wasn't a weak, handsome person like me. I'm not like this because of my practice, Kodo continued. I was like this before I began to practice Zazen. Zazen doesn't change a person. Zazen is good for nothing. And even though Kodo said this to Uchiyama, uh, Uchiyama always had this uh, expectation. He wrote about it. In the back of his mind, he always was expecting he would be something better. So then when Kodo died, um, after 25 years of practicing with him, Uchiyama finally realised that he hadn't changed at all. He was still this kind of weak, shrewd guy. Um, and actually, that was fine. And... Through, you know, from what Uchiyama learned from this, um, he used this expression basically that a violet blooms as a violet, a rose blooms as a rose. So while there, there's sort of these strong, impressive characters like Kodo who are sort of magnificent roses, uh, there's also these sort of you know delicate flowers like Uchiyama. And, and basically, the message behind that is you know it's it's enough to just be who you are. Um, yeah, so as I said before, you know, I always had this feeling that I wanted to be something special and have, you know, some sort of great identity. And um, I guess part of doing Zazen is I see that, you know, that that's something that maybe was always there. Like, uh, you know, it's that kind of ugly side that, that Kodo describes. Um, but I think, you know, if you truly practice Zazen uh, as something that's good for nothing, um, you can just experience the kind of importance of, you know, blossoming, you know, this flower analogy, just blossoming wholeheartedly as who you really are. Okay, so that's me for number 12. Uh, does anyone have any questions before I continue? Okay, um, and now I'll do number 18. Behold it on the rice mask.